Over the last few parts of this lecture series, we have been taking a look at the Lorentz transformation properties of four momentum eigenstates which describe massless particles. The general theory told us that when a Lorentz transformation of coordinates is carried out, the operator u of lambda acts on these momentum eigenstates. u lambda acting on psi p sigma is given by this expression where the factor in front is just a matter of keeping the normalization right. But what is absolutely important is this set of coefficients d sigma prime sigma of w lambda p which are coefficients of psi lambda p comma sigma prime in this expansion where of course you have a summation over sigma prime. Now w lambda p is given by L inverse lambda p lambda L of p where L is a standard Lorentz transformation which takes a standard four momentum which we have to choose case by case to the particular four momentum we are looking at. Now it so happens that L inverse lambda p lambda L p when it acts on k the standard four momentum it gives back k. So these elements w lambda p which are Lorentz transformations are special Lorentz transformations in the sense that they keep the standard four momentum unchanged. And when you take them all together you get what is called the little group for that particular four momentum. Now we have already seen that for massless particles the four momentum that we can choose is given by the following. k mu the four momentum has four components and what we have chosen is of the form kappa 0 0 kappa. That is you have a particle which is moving along the z axis or the third axis with a three momentum of magnitude kappa and that happens to be the same as the energy or the zeroth term k0. Remember we are using c equal to 1 in the whole discussion. Now we had worked out in the previous part of the lecture that the little group for this particular four momentum happens to be ISO2, the group of inhomogeneous rotations in a plane, that is two-dimensional rotations and translations. A typical element in this particular group can be parameterized by three parameters which you have called alpha, beta and theta. And W alpha beta theta can be written down in the form S of alpha beta times R of theta. As we had already worked out in the previous parts of these lectures, S of alpha beta, this Lorentz transformation matrix, has components given by 1 plus zeta alpha beta minus zeta alpha 1 0 minus alpha beta 0 1 minus beta zeta alpha beta 1 minus zeta, where this quantity zeta is not an independent quantity, zeta is alpha square plus beta square by 2. So only alpha and beta are the two parameters which describe this matrix S. R of theta is of course a much simpler object, it's just the matrix which describes rotations in two dimensions, in particular rotation in the xy plane about an axis which is the z-axis. Despite the complicated appearance of the matrix S alpha beta, you can easily show that S alpha bar beta bar times S alpha comma beta is simply S alpha bar plus alpha beta bar plus beta, which is very similar to the more obvious result R of theta bar times R of theta is R theta bar plus theta. Now this goes to show that if we take only matrices of the form S alpha beta, that is we take w's of the form alpha comma beta comma zero, then we get a subgroup of the little group which is abelian and another obvious abelian subgroup which we have is if we take alpha and beta both to be zero which gives us identity for s alpha beta that is we take only the rotations about the z axis r of theta which again rather obviously forms a abelian group. Now we have found that these two abelian subgroups together build up our little group ISO2 and the group itself is not abelian because R of theta does not commute with S of alpha beta. We have figured out already that R of theta S alpha beta R inverse theta is S of alpha cos theta plus beta sin theta 
comma minus alpha sin theta plus beta cos theta. So basically R of theta conjugation on S alpha beta rotates alpha and beta through an angle theta. Now that is easily understandable in terms of the connection with ISO2. Just as in ISO2, the way in which two W elements combine, W alpha bar, beta bar, theta bar, times W alpha beta theta, again, something we have already worked out earlier, is W alpha bar plus alpha cos theta bar plus beta sin theta bar, comma beta bar minus alpha sin theta bar plus beta cos theta bar, comma theta bar plus theta. And that essentially tells us that when you talk of the whole group, the rotation part essentially does its own thing, combines among itself. On the other hand, for the other part, the alpha beta part, which really corresponds to translations in a plane, does not directly do its own thing in the sense that you don't get alpha bar plus alpha comma beta bar plus beta. You get alpha bar, but to it, what is added is something which you get by applying R2 theta bar the two-dimensional rotation on alpha beta and a similar thing happens for the second argument of W. This actually goes to show that ISO2 is a semi-direct product of the rotation subgroup and the translation subgroup, which as we have already ex explained in the last class is not a surprise and in fact is very similar to the power cutting group which is of course much more complicated because it works in all of four dimensions. Our job at this point is to try to figure out the representation theory for this little group ISO2. Now we could have figured out this representation group starting from scratch, building up essentially on the group composition rule which we have written down right here, and essentially following the same route that we did when we tried to figure out the Poincaré group generators and their commutation relations. We could have done all that, but we don't really have to. Remember that each of these W elements are actually Lorentz transformations. So we can borrow from our knowledge of Lorentz group representations and that will help us cut down on our task a lot. So the upshot is this. Even though the ISO2 group is unfamiliar, perhaps to most of you, its representation theory is really rather simple to get at and that is what we are going to discuss next. The first task is to figure out the generators of the little group and the algebra obeyed by them. And for that, we will start with the general element W alpha beta theta, which is the product of the S matrix and the R theta matrix, as we have already discussed. At this point, I have realized that my notation differs from Weinberg's a bit. Weinberg actually labels W with the arguments theta, alpha, beta in that order. I have somehow managed to put theta at the end, but I will be consistent with that throughout, so there should really be no problems with this. Anyway, W alpha, beta, theta equal to S alpha, beta, R theta sounds more natural than saying W theta alpha, beta is S alpha, beta, R theta, at least to my mind. So that's what I'm going to keep on using. Now this is, of course, for a general element, but for the purpose of constructing generators of this particular group, we will have to take a look at infinitesimal elements. So we are going to consider the situation where alpha, beta and theta are infinitesimally small and keep only first order terms in these parameters. That of course means that zeta, which is alpha square plus beta square by 2, has to be treated as 0 at least to the first order. So W alpha, beta, theta, for infinitesimal parameters alpha, beta and theta, take the following form. 1, alpha, beta, 0, alpha, beta, 1, 0, 0, 1, minus alpha, minus beta, 0 again, alpha, beta, 1. That's for the S alpha, beta part, multiplied by 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, theta, 0, 0, minus theta, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. Of course, 
what we have done is replace sine theta to theta in the first order and cosine theta to 1 because cosine theta differs from 1 in the second order. It's 1 minus theta square by 2 plus higher order terms. The first order it is just 1. Now these matrices are easily multiplied especially by recognizing that you have a 4 by 4 identity matrix in both of them to which you add a matrix which is first of all sparse and contains only infinitesimal elements to the first order. Here you get this 0, 0, 0, 0, minus alpha minus beta and alpha beta 0. So that's the S alpha beta for infinitesimal alpha beta of course. And similarly the R theta for infinitesimal theta becomes the 4 by 4 identity matrix plus 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, theta 0, 0, minus theta 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And now multiplying them together becomes very simple because the two identities give you the identity. And then you get a term which is essentially this matrix times identity plus identity times this matrix, which is the sum of these two matrices, plus a higher order term. The product of these two matrices will only contain second order terms, if any. And so we will just safely ignore them. So W alpha beta theta for infinitesimal alpha beta theta again, simply becomes 0 alpha beta 0, alpha beta 0 theta 0 minus theta 0, 0, sorry, not 0 here, minus alpha minus beta here, and then 0, alpha, beta, 0. Now, this should not come as a surprise because this, after all, is a general form for an infinitesimal Lorentz transformation. Uh, the mu nu with element of this of course, it's delta mu nu, which comes from the identity, plus omega mu nu, which are the standard parameters for Lorentz transformations. Now, I can immediately read off what omega mu nu are. I can see here that omega 0, 1, omega 1, 0 are both equal and equal to alpha. And you have omega 1, 1, 3 here, which is minus alpha, so minus omega 1, 3, and it's also plus omega 3, 1. So those are all the alphas, the betas here are omega 0, 2, also omega 2, 0, this one, then you have minus omega 2, 3, and plus omega 3, 2. And then you have the theta, which is omega 1, 1, 2, minus omega 2, 1. Now, in case you are wondering about the anti-symmetry of the omega mu nu parameters, let me remind you that anti-symmetry is manifest when you are using lower indices. Indeed, you can easily read off here that omega 0, 1, what you, which you get by lowering this, is minus alpha because you have lowered the 0 index. Omega 1, 0, on the other hand, you are just lowering a spatial index that comes with no extra sign. So that's plus alpha. So minus alpha here is minus omega 1, 0. That's the anti-symmetry that we were looking for at. Omega 1, 3, on the other hand, if you lower this spatial index, there is no change of sign. So omega 1, 3 and omega 3, 1 are negatives of each other. And in fact, you can easily see that there is just minus alpha. Or omega 3, 1 is plus alpha. Similarly, what you have here is omega 0, 2 is minus beta and omega 2, 3 
is also minus beta. Finally, omega 1, 2 is minus omega 2, 1, of course, and that's theta. So, armed with this and our knowledge from a past lecture or from the general theory of Lorentz transformations, where we had this result that if you have a Lorentz transformation lambda, which is identity plus omega, that is, differs slightly from the identity infinitesimally, then the corresponding operator u would be given by identity operator plus i by 2 omega mu nu j mu nu. Of course, for the Poincaré -E generators, there was a minus i epsilon mu p mu, but that's not our concern right now. These are just pure Lorentz transformations. So, based on that, what we can immediately write down is our u for w alpha beta theta again for infinitesimal alpha beta theta is given by identity plus i times omega 0 1 that is minus alpha times j 0 1 this i by 2 takes care of the fact that you have two repeats of the same thing. You have minus alpha j01 from omega 01 j01. You have plus alpha times j10 from omega 10 j10 and these two are equal and that cancels the factor of 2. But that's not the only term with alpha. Then you have omega 31 which is alpha. So i alpha j31. So those are the two terms which have alpha in them, the two terms with beta is going to be i times minus beta j02 and then you have a beta term from this which is the term from omega 2, 3 again minus beta j23 and finally there's a theta term which is i times theta times j12. So collecting the terms together, what we get is identity plus i alpha times minus j01 plus j31. Plus i beta times minus j02 minus j23 plus i theta times j12. And remembering our identification of the boost J01, J02, J03 as the boost generators K1, K2, K3 and corresponding by identification for the spatial index Js with the angular momentum components can immediately write this down as identity plus I alpha A plus I beta B plus I theta J3 where A and B are simply the following minus j01 plus j31 that's our a and b is minus j02 minus j23 and using the identification this is minus k1 plus j2 and this is minus k2 minus j1. Now let me point out that this is once again a point where what I am writing down differs from what Weinberg has in his book. Weinberg writes A as j2 plus k1 and B as minus j1 plus k2. In other words, what Weinberg is doing here is identifying J01 with minus K1 or actually he is identifying J10 with K1. Remember the J mu nu's are anti-symmetric in mu and nu's. And again the same thing with J02. Instead of identifying J02 with K2, he is identifying J20 with K2. Now it seems to me that this is the typographical error in Weinberg. If you are referring to the first edition, 
you will see that there Weinberg actually identifies J I zero with the K I. That particular identification would have consistently given you exactly what Weinberg had written here. However, in the later editions, Weinberg actually has corrected the identification, and in the later editions, J I zero is not identified with K I. It is identified with minus K I, and J zero I is identified with K I. And that particular later identification of J0I with KI seems to be correct, simply because that is what completely reproduces the commutation relations that are written down among the Js and Ks and Ps. Now, I'm not very sure what happened here, but my guess would be that realizing that there was a typographical error in his earlier version, Feinberg corrected that, but this error. If it is an error, which was also there in his previous edition, has still persisted and not been corrected. Anyway, what I'm going to do is I'm going to identify a with minus k1 plus j2 and b with minus k2 minus j1. Let me assure you that the final result that we are going to look at will not depend on this. So, whether you use Weinberg's version for a and b or this version, you will get the same final result. However, this is a bit of a sore point and it took me quite some time to figure this out and decide that what I'm doing here is correct. Of course, I may not be. So please check this out for yourself. Our next step would be to figure out the algebra of these three generators. Thankfully, we already know the commutation relations between the J's and the K's from our study of the Poincaré group earlier. And let me just remind you that, well, the commutation relation between the J's hardly needs any reminding. This is, of course, the well-known angular momentum commutation relations. The fact that the K's are vector operators immediately lead to a very similar commutation relation here. J i commuted with K j is going to be i epsilon i j k k k. The only other new kind of commutation relation here is that between the k's and ki kj is going to be given by minus i epsilon i j k i j k j k. So these are the basic commutation relations which we will use to find out the commutation relations between A, B and J3. So, let's begin by trying to calculate the commutation relation between A and B themselves, the two generators of the S subgroup. This is of course J2 minus K1 minus J1 minus K2. This is the commutator that we need to calculate. Now, this of course breaks down into four commutators, one between J2 and J1. There is a commutator between J2 and K2, which according to this equation is zero, so I'm not writing that down. There is another one between K1 and J1, which is also zero for the same reason. And then you have finally this commutation relation between K1 and K2. Now J2, J1's commutator is actually negative of J1, J2's commutator, which of course, is ij3. Whereas k1, k2's commutator is minus ij3. So, a result that we immediately get is the operators a and b commute. Now, given that they generate translations in the plane in the equivalent iso2 setting, it's rather obvious that a and b should commute with each other. This should not come as a surprise because translations in two different directions, of course, commute. Now, what about the commutator between J3 and A and J3 and B? So, let's calculate them. That's even easier than this one. J3, comma A is simply the commutator between J3 and J2 minus K1. The J3, J2 commutator is simply minus IJ1, standard angular momentum commutation relation. J3 minus K1 is 
minus j3 comma k1 and from this relation that's actually minus i k2. So this actually is i times b. So j3 and a do not commute. The commutator is i times b. What about j3 comma b? Well, that's also straightforward. J3 comma minus J1 minus K2. This one is minus I J2. And J3 minus K2 is plus I K1. So this is actually minus I times A. So the upshot of all this is the three generators that we have obey the following algebra. The commutation relations are given by J3 commuted with A is IB. J3 commuted with B is minus IA and A and B commute. Before we wrap up this part of the lecture, let me show you how we could derive the commutation relations the ones we have found out just now, in an alternative way, starting directly from the composition rule for two little group elements. Remember W alpha bar beta bar theta bar times W alpha beta theta was given by this expression here. Now, this composition rule is actually all that you really need to find out the commutation relations between the generators. After all, this composition rule tells you all that there is about the way the group elements combine. Of course, what we did a while ago was exploited the fact that we already knew the Lorentz algebra and essentially use our knowledge of the Lorentz algebra to figure out the commutation relations. Let us just pretend for the time being that we don't know anything about the Poincaré or the Lorentz algebra. And we will start directly from this particular composition rule and try to use exactly the same steps that we had done before to establish what the commutation relations between generators would be. Of course, what we are going to say is if W alpha beta theta, we're describing an infinitesimal transformation, that is, if alpha beta theta were infinitesimal, then this Corresponding operator u w alpha beta theta would simply be identity plus i alpha a plus i beta b plus i theta j3 and we are going to proceed from there. But before we do that, let me just introduce to you the inverse of a particular w that is the parameters which describe the inverse of w alpha beta theta. And that is pretty straightforward. If W alpha bar beta bar theta bar happen to be the inverse of W alpha beta theta, then this composition should have given you the identity. And for the identity, these parameters, all three of them should be zero. So obviously the easiest result that you can immediately get is theta bar plus theta has to be zero, which implies, of course, that theta bar is minus theta. We then have alpha bar plus alpha cos theta bar, but we can, of course, use theta bar is minus theta to write this as alpha cos theta minus beta sine theta equals zero, implying alpha bar is minus alpha cos theta plus beta sine theta. And very similarly, we can get beta bar for the inverse transformation is simply minus alpha sine theta minus beta cos theta. Now, why do we need this? We need this simply because what we are going to do next is we are going to use our standard similarity transformation. This is exactly what we did when we figured out the Poincaré algebra from the Poincaré group composition rule. And essentially the same kind of calculation. What we are going to do is look at W inverse alpha beta theta 
डब्ल्यू अल्फा बार बीटा बार थीटा बार टाइम्स डब्ल्यू अल्फा बीटा थीटा एंड I don't really want to burden you with the details of the calculation. It's just mere algebra, which you can always check out yourselves. The final result turns out to be something which looks a bit complicated, but that's simply because we are not using, say, matrix notation and just writing all the parameters out explicitly. The final result turns out to be W of alpha bar minus alpha times cosine theta minus beta bar minus beta times sin theta plus alpha cosine theta bar minus theta plus beta sine theta bar minus theta. That actually is what the first argument for this composite W becomes. The second argument is alpha bar minus alpha sine theta plus Maybe you should be able to guess this one, beta bar minus beta cosine theta and minus alpha sine theta bar minus theta plus beta cosine theta bar minus theta. And third argument actually is very simple because after all, the third argument just adds up. And so what you are going to get here is minus theta from here, plus theta from here, and theta bar, and they will add up to give you just theta bar. So this is what you get when you conjugate W alpha bar beta bar theta bar using the element W alpha beta theta. Now the next step will look pretty familiar to you. If you have already watched my earlier video in the same series on the derivation of the Poincaré algebra. What we are going to do is we are going to consider the situation where the parameters alpha bar, beta bar and theta bar are infinitesimally small. Under this situation, this rather complicated looking expression on the right hand side reduces to something slightly simpler, but a lot simpler. It becomes W alpha bar cosine theta minus beta bar sine theta. plus theta bar into alpha sine theta plus beta cos theta. Once again, I am omitting the details of this calculation, which is pretty straightforward and trivial. You can do it yourselves. That is, of course, the first argument. The second argument becomes alpha bar sine theta plus beta bar cosine theta plus theta bar minus alpha cosine theta plus beta sine theta. Find the third argument, of course, is theta bar. Know that what we have done here is we have assumed alpha bar, beta bar, and theta bar are tiny, and we have just kept up to first order terms in these three parameters. So now, realize that although this is a relationship between the Lorentz group elements or specifically the little group elements, this directly translates to the relationship between the unitary operators which act on my state space when we talk about action on a quantum mechanical Hilbert space. So what this becomes is U inverse corresponding to W alpha beta theta times U corresponding to this, but for infinitesimal alpha bar, beta bar, theta bar, we already know that this is 1 plus i alpha bar times a plus i beta bar times b plus i theta bar times j3 times u of w alpha beta theta. And that becomes identity plus i alpha bar cosine theta minus beta bar sine theta plus theta bar into alpha sine theta plus beta cos theta. This whole thing into A plus I times alpha bar sine theta plus 
beta bar cosine theta plus theta bar into minus alpha cosine theta plus beta sine theta into b plus i theta bar j3. Collecting coefficients of alpha bar, beta bar and theta bar separately gives us the following. U inverse W alpha beta theta times A U W alpha beta theta. That is exactly what multiplies I alpha bar on this side and you can easily see that that's a cosine theta from here plus b sine theta from the second term. U inverse w alpha beta theta b u w alpha beta theta also can be figured out very very simply by looking at the coefficient of i beta bar on the right hand side that's minus a sine theta plus b cosine theta and finally, u inverse w alpha beta theta j3 u w alpha beta theta. That's slightly more complicated. j3 obviously from here. But you also have other i theta bar terms. So plus alpha sine theta plus beta cosine theta a plus minus alpha cosine theta plus beta sine theta into b. So this is how the generators transform under the little group operations. Let us now consider the special case where the parameters alpha, beta and theta are themselves infinitesimal. And what I am going to do is Omit some steps which are pretty straightforward and should be familiar if you have seen the Poincaré algebra videos and write down the result directly. For example, the first expression out here simply becomes for infinitesimal alpha, beta and theta a minus i times alpha a plus beta b plus theta j3's commutator with a assembly a plus theta b. Of course, all I have done is replaced theta by infinitesimal parameter and kept only up to the first order. That is sine theta is just theta and cos theta is of course 1 at that level. If you now compare the coefficients of alpha, beta and theta on both sides, you immediately get the results. Apart from the obvious result that a is commuted with a is 0, there being no alpha on the other side, you also get the result that B's commutator with A vanishes and J3's commutator with A is I times B. You can carry out a similar calculation with the other two relations. In fact, you only need to consider the second of the two conjugation relations here to derive the result that J3, comma B is minus IA. I'm leaving that as a simple exercise for you to carry out. So now we have derived the algebra of the generators of the little group in two different manners. One, the one which Weinberg uses in his book, relying on the fact that these generators can be written down in terms of Lorentz group generators and then use the known results for commutators between Lorentz group generators. And the second, the one I have presented to you right now, just starts from the composition rule of the little group itself and the result sort of follows directly from that. Having found out the algebra, our next step would be to find out the action of these algebra elements on our Hilbert space vectors. So that is what we are going to discuss in the next part. The important point is, this is going to tell us how massless particle states actually respond when you go from one inertial frame to another. 
and as a result reveal what kind of massless particle states are possible in the first place. But all that is for the next part.